what I want to talk about this afternoon is uh, anesthetic um, complications um, and sort of how you're going to manage them. It's actually a huge topic, and if I try and get through everything really quickly, I'll probably miss some points. So I'm just going to get through what we can get through in the next hour, okay? Other thing is when I lecture, I really like it if people ask questions whenever they come about, okay? I have no problems if you want to interrupt me. Um, if you want to disagree with me, that's okay too. Um, no problem. Um, really what I hope that you would come out with after this is have a better idea of how to manage some of the problems that you're undoubtedly going to see and you are already probably seeing. So one of the things I think that's really important to stress is there's a big difference between a complication and an error. Um, I don't want errors ever, ever, ever to happen during anesthesia. Complications, I don't mind. Complications make it interesting. Errors, on the other hand, don't make it interesting. So the difference between a complication and an error Complication is really defined as a difficult factor or issue appearing unexpectedly and changing your existing plans. Sort of unavoidable. Things happen. The patient becomes hypotensive. That happens. The patient becomes bradycardic. That happens. Um, errors, on the other hand, are things you don't ever want to happen. And those are things that through ignorance, deficiency, or accident, departs or fails to achieve what should be done. Um, things like leaving a pop-off valve closed is a good example of an error. It's avoidable. Um, shouldn't happen, okay? And I'm really going to focus on this uh, upper portion here, talking about complications, but I'm going to just tell you in my experience what probably some of the most common errors are. And one of the things about veterinary medicine uh, compared to, say, human medicine is we don't really look at why anesthetic accidents happen with the same vigilance they do in human medicine. If a patient who's anesthetized in human medicine has a negative outcome, you want to bet there's going to be a, a serious investigation into that and figure out exactly why did it occur, what happened, and so forth. In veterinary medicine, I hate to say it, but people are like, well, you know, every once in a while one dies. Well, actually, it's not really like that. Maybe one out of every 10,000 should die. Um, one out of every 1,000 would be too many, okay? So we just don't really have the data like they do in human medicine. So when I talk about the errors, what are the most common, those are the things I've witnessed happening most, happening most commonly, as well as it's a little bit based on what information comes out of the human literature. Um, I'm going to just tell you a couple things, too, about just managing your complications and minimizing your errors. This is not rocket science stuff here that I'm talking about when I'm talking about how to prevent them. A lot of it is based on your knowledge and expertise. If you're doing anesthesia in your practice, it's incumbent upon you to learn as much as you possibly can about the anesthesia and to encourage your doctors to do the same if they're going to oversee it. Um, another thing I think that's really important and that we do fairly regularly at Ken West is we actually anticipate and prepare for any bad event happening. And we actually have checklists that we go through, just like uh, you would if you were flying an airplane, you go through a checklist. Well, we have a little checklist that says, did you check this? Did this happen? This happened? So that we don't have errors or things that just got forgotten during the anesthetic period. So checklists are really, really valuable. And one of the things on the checklist that every technician is supposed to address is, did you anticipate negative events happening, or what are the potential complications associated with this procedure? You're doing a thoracotomy on a dog. What are the potential problems? So that you're already clued in and already thinking about it, so that when that patient is having difficulty, or it's not breathing well, or it becomes hypoxic, you've already taken the time to sort of think about, well, why did it become hypoxic? How would I deal with it? How could I manage it? Um, I always sort of equate uh, anesthesia to, uh, this is sort of a side, but I always sort of think of it as uh, it being like a high-performance athlete, um, which I'm not, of course. Um, but I always think of anesthesia as being like that. You do a lot of visualization and planning before the anesthesia even happens, and that's what athletes do. They do a lot of visualization and planning before they actually go out and compete and say, oh, I'm winning this race. We do the same thing with anesthesia. Another big part to sort of help prevent these errors from happening or to you know, address complications as they happen is vigilance and continual assessment of the patient. Nothing drives me more crazy than somebody who's supposed to be doing anesthesia who's off, you know, wandering around the hospital. That wouldn't be me. Uh, <laughs> the techs I can see who work with me are like, wait a second, that's Craig to the T. I'll be back in a minute. Gone. 
Um, but it's so important, and you know, and I'm and you know, I, I I make light of it, but it's because they're there on the cases, and I'm sort of helping them manage them. But one of the things that I learned early on in my anesthetic career when I was doing my residency is to stay in contact with my patient. And so a lot of the times, I like to keep a hand on the patient that I'm anesthetizing myself. Part of it is because I know I am very easily distracted. You know, there's a shiny object in the room. I'm there. <laughs> So, you know, it is one of those things where I sort of feel like, you know, I, I do need to focus. And so if I do start yapping at somebody or talking or I'm talking to the tech about this is happening with this case or whatever, my hand's still on the patient. So I, if the patient moves or if the respiration changes or the pulse changes, I can actually feel that. All right. So I think staying in contact with your patient is really important. And then just practice and experience uh, doing it more and more and more and more and more makes you better, obviously, because you, you know, you then have seen a lot of other things that can happen. So what are some of the common anesthetic errors? And again, I don't want to belabor on this area because hopefully these aren't going to happen to you um, and hopefully you avoid them. This is probably number one, closed pop-off valve. The pop-off valve gets left closed accidentally. Someone's doing IPPV, so you're bagging for the patient. You leave the pop-off closed. The next thing you know, you notice bradycardia in your patient. You're like, huh, isn't that weird? It's bradycardic. Um, and then the next thing you know, it gets worse and worse and worse. You don't recognize the pop-off's closed and the patient dies. Um, not good. Um, but you can easily avoid that problem. This is what we have now in all our anesthetic machines. Has anyone seen one of these little valves? Okay, if you haven't, get it into your practice as soon as possible. Um, what it is is a momentary closure valve for your pop-off. It goes on right after, you know, the pop-off valve normally sits and then it goes to your scavenging system. This valve sits between your scavenging system and the pop-off valve. And you should never, ever, ever have to close your pop-off valve when you have one of these. All you do is you push this little button right here. You push the button and it closes it momentarily. And then there's a little spring inside and it pops back open, all right? So it's super, it really adds a huge amount of safety to the anesthesia. I can't say enough about these valves, except that they're ridiculously expensive. Like, I think they're $95 for a little piece of plastic. Um, but having said that, if it saves one patient's life, it's worth it. Another big problem is just failure to recognize an impending problem. So, in other words, you're not paying attention. The animal is becoming progressively bradycardic, respiration rate has changed, and you don't really recognize what's happening and make bad mistakes um, or make bad decisions. So, again, you can avoid that. Um, improper or inappropriate equipment use is another one. Um, as you guys probably recognize, the anesthesia machines that we use are so variable. You're using everything from a human anesthesia machine that's you know 50, 60 years old to some veterinary specific machine that's basically a vaporizer on a stick to some um, you know some of these uh, human anesthesia machines which are super complex but have a ton of built-in redundancy and safety features and I remember when I first brought one of these big human machines into our hospital, everyone was like, oh my god, I don't want to use this thing, this is ridiculous, like it's got all these knobs and buttons and, you know, and now I guarantee you that's the one they want to use the most because the machine tells you the most information, it's, it just adds a little bit of extra safety. But again, you do have to know how all these machines work and if you don't understand the proper functioning of an anesthesia machine, you shouldn't be using one, period, or any of the anesthetic equipment. It's so important because equipment errors happen. Um, drug administration is another one, which again, we can avoid by double checking. Um, and you know, the other thing that happens sometimes is we have unlabeled syringes or something that get left around. If in doubt, throw it out is sort of my motto. Um, death by decimal is a really bad one. You make one decimal error. This is why I always use a calculator. Um, regardless, yes, we can all calculate 10 times 3 in our head and then divide it by 5. But really, if you use a calculator, you're less likely to make a, uh, an error, okay? So do use a calculator. Um, too fast, too slow administration, uh, again, that can cause an error, which could lead to an accidental overdose um, with an anesthetic in a patient as well. So, you know, do be vigilant. This is another big one that uh, I see quite a bit, and I probably saw this a lot with vet students, right? Like vet students, they're, they're pretty good. Um, but they got to know a lot of stuff and a lot of them really don't like anesthesia and they don't care about it. They don't think it's really that important. Um, and so they don't pay as much attention during those early years as they should have. And then when they come on to clinics, they make all these bad decisions based on misinterpretation of the information. So a classic one I can think of is I had a student telling me their animal had arrested 
And I was like, oh, isn't that interesting? Just boop, out of the blue. And really all they had done to diagnose the arrest was notice that the ECG was no longer blip, blip, blipping along. Well, the clip fell off. The animal didn't arrest. So again, but if that student had been there making the decisions on the case without, you know, an anesthesiologist or someone's backup, next thing you know, they're giving it epinephrine and atropine and away you go. So, um, so those things can happen. I could tell you a million stories about ridiculous things people have done. Very anesthesia. I remember one time, I'll tell you another one, just about knowing how your anesthetic equipment works. I had a, a student who's now a surgeon, um, but at the time she was uh, a vet student. It's a good thing she became a surgeon and didn't become an anesthesiologist, I guess. But uh, we had an esophageal stethoscope in a patient, and we used to use IV extension lines for lengthening the esophageal stethoscope, right, to get further away from the patient. Well, the student's patient starts to get light, and so they're topping it up with propofol through the esophageal stethoscope. No problem, really, for the patient, but it sure didn't get any deeper uh, as she's panicking about it. Um, I can tell you another one, just because I'm just thinking about it now, okay, and then i got to move on. But I'll tell you another one I had, a uh, temperature probe that got shoved, like someone was feeding a temperature probe down, like, you know, those long stringy looking temperature probes um, that you can put into the esophagus. I had a student feed one of those into the dog blindly, fine, that's what a lot of us do. They fed it all the way in. The surgeon's doing a thoracotomy to remove, uh, um, I think it was a bulla or something like that. And she puts her stapler across and staples the lung and then she she's going to cut it and she's like, what the heck, my stapler won't close all the way. Turned out that what had happened is she ended up getting the stapler closed, starts cutting through the lung and hits something really hard like a foreign body. It was the friggin' th uh, temperature probe had gone, instead of it's down the esophagus, it actually went down the trachea, past the endotracheal tube and into the exact lung lobe that she was removing. Unbelievable. I mean, that'll never, ever, I'll never, ever, ever see that happen again, but it was awesome. So anyway, I, I could do, again, I could tell you, I was just thinking of another time I had a, uh, <laughs> a, a, a student lose an endotracheal tube down a horse, which was really cool. <laughs> and he, he was a resident, and he's panicking, oh my God, Dr. Mosley, the horse just swallowed the endotracheal tube, what am I going to do? And I'm like, don't worry, the endotracheal tube, you can still breathe, and the horse goes, <clears throat> <clears throat> and out comes the endotracheal tube, so it was really cool. So, yeah, you can see a lot of fun. So I think anesthesia is obviously awesome. That's why I do it. It's super fun. Um, but I don't really like to see all those things happening. So, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and get more serious now and we're stay focused. Okay. We're going to talk about some of the complications that are fairly common. And I like to break it down into the sort of three phases of anesthesia, the induction, the maintenance, and the recovery phase is when we see a lot of the complications. And I'll just tell you that actually a lot of the anesthetic deaths that occur actually happen in recovery or during induction. Most of the anesthetic deaths don't occur in the maintenance phase, okay? So it's usually in the induction and in recovery, and usually it's related to an error rather than a complication, okay? So someone didn't pick something up that they should have. Um, these are complications that you're going to come across, and I'm going to go through each one of these, and as you can see, it's quite a list, so it's unlikely that we're going to get through them. One of the big uh, things that I get people telling me about is they're like, oh, I had this reaction to propofol. I had this reaction to this drug. We can never use it in the patient again. Well, one of the things you guys really want to know is you want to know how your drugs work, okay? And some of these so-called reactions are actually normal for the drug, okay? So, for example, have any of you guys seen, like, twitching and opisthotinus and from propofol? Totally normal. It is not an uh, abnormal reaction. It doesn't mean the animal is going to, you know, start to seize or anything like that. It's a totally normal situation. It happens in about 10 to 11 percent of unpremedicated animals. It can also happen with ketamine. Um, and we don't have Atomidate in Canada, but it's another anesthetic which is associated with a lot of twitchiness and so forth. Um, apnea, some people will say, oh, he stopped breathing after I gave thio or propofol. Well, yep, guess what? That's a side effect of thio or propofol. Normal. It will happen. A lot of it is related to the way you administer the drug, though. Obviously, if you give the drug as a big bolus or too high a dose, you're going to see the apnea. It's not an adverse reaction. It's a normal reaction. So anticipate it and realize it can happen. Hypotension is another one. Obviously, you can see that with propofol. You can see that with any of them. Excitement associated with the induction of anesthesia is another one that people will talk about. And then it'll be, again, they'll say, oh, it's a reaction. Well, actually, how many of you guys pre-med with uh, benzodiazepines? No one? 
few. Good, because actually benzodiazepines tend to be bad um, pre-meds. You get a lot of excitement in your patients with benzodiazepines, so I wouldn't recommend it. But again, that's normal. We know that benzodiazepines will do that. 